Me too. So it's a great pleasure to have today to have Ivan Velenik from the University of Geneva, who is going to let us know about fluctuation theory for a layer of unstable phase in the planar easing model. Ivo? Thank you for the introduction, and I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to speak at this seminar. So my talk will be based on a joint work with Sebastian Ott, Senja Schlossmann, and my longtime friend and collaborator, Dima Yoffe, who passed away almost one year from now. Uh, my talk is about the planarizing model. I guess that all of you are pretty familiar with it, so I will very briefly introduce it, basically to fix my notations. So I will always work on the lattice Z2 with nearest neighbor interactions, and mostly I will be working in a finite box Vn, uh, which is just a square of side lengths to n. Okay. All the uh, configuration of the model will be an assignment of a spin plus or minus one at each vertex of the lattice Z2. Um, and uh, all the spins which are outside the box Bn, they are frozen to some value here on my picture. It's, they are all frozen to the value plus one, which is the plus boundary condition. And uh, the only uh, spin that uh, are allowed to vary are those inside Bn. Then given a configuration of the system compatible with the boundary condition, uh, which I call sigma, such a configuration, I can associate to it uh, an energy through the Hamiltonian Hn, which is the usual easing Hamiltonian. So you have a parameter beta, which is uh, non-negative. It's uh, an inverse temperature. And the Hamiltonian is just minus beta times the sum of all pairs of uh, nearest neighbors on the lattice, at least one of which belongs to the box Bn of the product sigma sigma g. So once you have associated to each configuration uh, some, some energy, you can use the usual recipe to construct a Gibbs measure, which is just the probability measure on all configurations compatible with the boundary condition that associates to configuration sigma, a probability proportional to exponential of minus the energy of the configuration sigma. So in this slide, I've used the plus boundary condition for simplicity. Of course, in this talk, we are, go we are going to use uh, various kinds of boundary conditions. In particular, uh, I will often use the minus boundary condition where all the spins outside Bn are fixed to the value minus one. And then the, all the notation will extend in the, in the natural way. Okay. Notice that I've used yellow as a color for my minus spins and blue for my plus spins. And I've tried to be consistent in the whole talk. So all the pictures will have blue spins for plus and yellow spin for, for minus. And I will also often talk of blue and yellow spins rather than plus and minuses. OK, so as is well known, the planarizing model undergoes a phase transition as you vary the parameter beta. So there is a critical value beta c, which is given here, uh, such that the, the following occurs. So if you fix some value of beta and you take a big enough box, so big enough might depend on the value of beta, then here is what you see inside your box Bn, typical configuration inside your box Bn for large n. So in the first row, you have uh, configuration which are typical under the measure with blue boundary condition. In the second row, you have configuration which are typical under the measure with yellow boundary condition. As you and you can see that as long as beta is smaller than beta critical, uh, if you go away from the boundary, then you see exactly the same. Uh, statistically, you see something which is identical in both rows. So there is only one micros macroscopic phase in this case, in contrast, when beta is larger than beta c, even looking close to the middle of your box, you can see which boundary condition was used. You can recognize that you had the blue boundary condition here and the yellow boundary con condition there because the, the spin of the corresponding colors are percolating. And uh, this corresponds to the fact that you have two uh, equilibrium phases at the macroscopic scale. And what I will be uh, interested in in this talk is what happens when you have spatial coexistence between these two phases, this blue and this yellow phase, what happens when they both coexist inside the box Bn? So there are several ways of uh, enforcing such a phase coexistence between uh, the, these two phases, and I want to briefly review them because this, this will be relevant for what I will say later. So the first way of enforcing is done as follow. So you fix some beta larger than beta c to have several phases. Then uh, let me denote by m star beta the spontaneous magnetization, which is just the expected value of the spin in the middle of the box. But when you use blue boundary condition, then you send the, the, the n to infinity. Okay, so it's a strictly positive number. Uh, then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the, the easing model in the box Bn with blue boundary condition and condition the fact that the total magnetization inside the box Bn, so the sum of the spins, is given by this uh, n times the size of the box Bn, 
where n is chosen strictly between minus the spontaneous magnetization and plus the spontaneous magnetization. Okay. If you do that and you sample a typical configuration under this condition gives measure, then what you see is the following. So there is creation of a unique giant droplet of yellow phase inside this background of blue phase. And uh, moreover, if you take a continuum limit, which means that you rescale the lattice by one over n and you let n go to infinity, then the shape of this uh, macroscopic droplet of minus phase becomes deterministic, converges to the solution of some variational problem, and the, the limiting shape is known as the Wolf shape. Okay. So the understanding of this type of phenomena uh, goes back to the 1990s, and I've listed here at the bottom of the page uh, a number of uh, re references on this topic. Okay. There is another way to enforce phase spatially, spatial coexistence of phases in your box BM, and it's by choosing a mixed boundary condition. Instead of choosing boundary condition where all spins are blue or all spin all sorry, all spins are yellow, you take a mixture of both and you hope that this will induce a spatial coexistence. And the simplest and most natural way to do that is to use the so-called Dobrushin boundary condition. So on the left here, you have the typical Dobrushin boundary condition where all the spins uh, which are in the upper half plane are frozen to the value plus one, and those in the lower half plane are frozen to the value minus one. While here on the right, I have a variant that I will be using in this uh, talk several times, where I'm imposing the blue boundary condition uh, on three sides and the yellow one on the fourth side, say the bottom, bottom side. Okay. Now, if you look again, you take beta larger than beta critical and you look at typical configurations under this boundary condition, then you get what you expect probably, which is uh, in the case of the usual boundary condition, you see the blue phase invading the top half of the box and the yellow phase invading the bottom half with a very well-defined interface between them. And uh, in the other case, since uh, three of the sides were favoring the blue spins, then you get the blue phase invading the whole box, except for a layer of yellow phase along the bottom wall. Okay. Now, as I said, you have very well-defined interfaces in both cases. And it's a very natural question to uh, try to understand the statistical properties of uh, these interfaces. This has been uh, some, uh, there, there has been work on this for decades now. And uh, I'm going to state the, the best result to date on this uh, issue. So if you make uh, a diffusive rescaling of this interface, that is you rescale everything horizontally by a factor one over n, vertically by a factor one over square root of n, exactly the kind of rescaling you would do to get convergence of a random walk to a Brownian motion. So if you do this one over n, one over root n scaling in both cases, then and you let n go to infinity, then the distribution of the interface will converge to the distribution of some uh, of the trajectories of some stochastic process, namely uh, in the case of the usual boundary condition you get as the limit a Brownian bridge, while uh, in the, the, the second case here, you get a Brownian excursion. Uh, moreover, uh, the, the diffusive constant associated to the underlying Brownian motion in both cases uh, is given by uh, the curvature of this wolf shape that I introduced before at its apex. So at this point, you look at the curvature here and this gives you diffusive constant of the uh, corresponding uh, Gaussian process. Okay, um, now I would like quickly to discuss a slightly different topic, which will uh, be useful for me both as a motivation later and uh, also because it will uh, have something to do with some elements of the proof. It's the issue of metastability. So metastability is usually a question which is uh, analyzed as a, as a dynamical phenomenon, but I'm only interested in this talk in the, the equilibrium aspects of this uh, metastability. Uh, namely, I'm going to do the, the following. So again, I take my box BN and I put now a yellow boundary condition on all four sides of the box. But to make things more interesting, I'm adding a second term to the Hamiltonian. So um, uh, another contribution to the energy, which models the presence of a magnetic field, which I assume to be positive. So I have a strictly positive H here, which is positive magnetic field, which is coupled as usual. So you get minus H times the magnetization in the box. So you see that uh, this term, if you want to lower the energy, the magnetization in the box has to be positive. So this term favors blue spins inside the box. Now the boundary condition obviously favors yellow spins inside the box because there are yellow boundary conditions. So a priori, you might get a competition between the boundary condition that wants to see yellow inside the yellow phase inside the box and the magnetic field that wants to see 
the blue phase inside the box. So let's see when such a competition should be expected. And uh, to see that, one way to see that, heuristically at least, is to look at the contribution to the total energy that comes from the boundary condition and from this magnetic field term. And you can see that uh, the effect of the boundary condition, well, the boundary condition only acts uh, directly on the outermost spin, outermost layer of spin inside the box Bn, and you have a order n such spins. So the, the first term is a order n. And the magnetic field term, well, it acts on all the spin inside the box, and you have a order n square such spins. So this term is a order h times n square. And if you want both terms to be of the same order so that you get a competition, you need to choose h of order one over n. So this is heuristic, but this has been made very precise in the 1990s by Senya and Roberto Schoenman. And what they did is as follows. So they consider the magnetic field of the form lambda over n, where lambda is some parameter. And they prove that this param if you change this parameter, there is a phase transition. So there is a critical value of this parameter, which I will call lambda c which is strictly positive and finite, such that, again, if I'm looking at typical configuration of the systems, I will, I will observe the following. So as long as lambda is smaller than lambda c, so if the magnetic field is sufficiently weak, if you wish, then the boundary condition uh, win. And inside the, 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 the box Bn, you see the, the yellow phase, okay? in spite of the fact that the yellow phase is unstable in the sense that for this value of h, which is strictly positive, if you take an infinite lattice, the only stable phase is the blue phase. But the boundary condition, uh, which favors this yellow phase, uh, stabilize the, 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 this yellow phase, and the minus phase, this yellow phase becomes metastable in this regime. On the other hand, as soon as lambda is larger than lambda critical, the, uh, it becomes worthwhile for the system to revert to the true equilibrium phase, which is the blue phase. And you see that the box is invaded by the blue phase, except uh, for a layer of unstable yellow phase along, along the boundary of the box. Okay. Actually, uh, Senya and Roberto proved more than that. What they prove is that if now you take again a scaling limit, you rescale the lattice by one over n and you send n to infinity, then the typical configuration that you see looks like that. So the blue phase invades almost all the box except some macroscopic regions close to the, the corners of the box. Okay. And this macroscopic uh, blue droplet is constructed using four line, straight line segments along the boundary here, and four arcs, which are actually quarters of the wool shape that I introduced before. Okay. The relative size of these arcs and these uh, line segments depends on the value of lambda and was uh, computed in this paper. Okay. So what we would like to understand, uh, a very natural question once you arrive here is uh, what is the stat statistical behavior of the interface between this, uh, this uh, uh, separating this layer of yellow phase and stable yellow phase and the stable blue phase in the bulk. So of course not in the limit where there is nothing to, to be seen, but uh, for very large finite systems. So what is the behavior in these curved pieces and along the wall? So the behavior of the fluctuation along curved pieces is something which has been understood already in the 1990s. Uh, for instance, in the paper by uh, Dobrushin and Rinif that I cite, uh, cited earlier. Okay. So what we will be interested in this talk is more- Excuse uh, me, Ivan, there is a question by uh, Ron. Yes. The question is, uh, is the critical lambda a function of the temperature? Yes. And how close the temperature is to criticality? I mean, if it depends on- The, the temperature is anything uh, larger than beta c. Beta is, any, is larger than beta c, that's the only constraint, but then lambda c depends on beta, yes. Does this answer the question? Thank Good. you. So, um, yeah, thanks. So, so just to yeah. remind everybody that the uh, questions are welcome either on the chat or, or you can just unmute yourself and ask a question directly. That's also uh, possible. Very good. So, the goal in this talk would be to understand the behavior of such a layer of unstable phase here. So, what is the behavior of the interface between this unstable layer of yellow phase and the, the blue phase, which is stable above it? Okay. So away from the corners, so really in these regions that I've highlighted here. Okay. So I, have not, I will not do that in this particular geometry that uh, uh, Roberto and Senia have investigated. I will look at a slightly simpler geometry, uh, but the question will be exactly the same. And in principle, one should be able to deduce the result for the geometry Senia and Roberto investigated using uh, uh, our result. But this requires some additional work. Okay, in any case, so what we're going to do is the following. So I'm looking at this uh, Dobrushin style boundary condition where I have blue boundary condition on three sides and yellow on the fourth side. 
But again, I'm introducing this magnetic field term with a strictly positive magnetic field H. Okay. So if you look again at typical configuration, so here on the left, I've uh, shown again what we saw earlier, which is typical configuration under this boundary condition when you don't have magnetic field. So H is equal to zero. So in this case, I told you that under a diffusive rescaling of the interface, the limiting process was non degenerate It was a Brownian excursion. So this immediately implies that the, the, the expected uh, width of this layer of yellow face here is mesoscopic. It's a four-door square root of n. It's not macroscopic. If you take a continuum limit, it will disappear, but it, it's uh, diverging at the microscopic scale. Okay. On the other hand, as soon as H is positive, uh, the layer of the yellow phase becomes unstable and the layer of yellow phase uh, has a width which is a further one. It's really microscopic, a microscopic layer. And of course, that's the, the regime I want to understand. So it looks a bit uh, like a bad news because how do you want to prove some interesting uh, scaling limit for this interface if it has a width of order one? I mean, the, the only scaling limit you will see is the straight line. So not very interesting a priori, but the, the observation is the following. So what you could do is instead of considering one particular value of H, you can take a sequence of values of H, smaller and smaller, all strictly positive, but smaller and smaller. And what you see is what I've depicted here. So these are uh, the behavior of this layer for uh, five values of the magnetic field, all strictly positive, but smaller and smaller. And what you see is that the width of the layer increases as H decreases. So the, the hope now is that you can, uh, if you let at the same time H decrease and N goes to infinity, so H decreases towards zero and N goes to infinity, then maybe you can get non-trivial scaling behavior for the interface uh, here between this unstable layer and the, the stable blue phase. Okay. So that's exactly uh, what we are going to do. So we are going to, to choose H as a function of N, and actually we are going to choose H as lambda over N to mimic what we saw in the schonmann schlossmann uh, geometry. Okay, they have exactly this relation. So we want to, to, to model what they see along the boundary. So we are going to take exactly the same type of behavior. Okay. Now, uh, let me say what is uh, known about this problem. So uh, this has been studied for a very long time, this kind of question, especially in the physics literature. I'm only going to speak about the mathematically rigorous results. Okay. And the first rigorous result, the first series of rigorous results was, were not for this two-dimensional easing model, which is much more complicated. They were for effective models. So what is an effective model? It's a caricature of this, uh, this two-dimensional easing model in which you remove all the ingredients that should not be essential in the description. So for instance, all these yellow excitations that you see inside the blue phase, so all these blue excitation that you see inside the yellow phase, you just remove them. That's already a simplification then the interface itself, it's a nasty object because it's the boundary of a two-dimensional random set. Okay, it's a complicated object. But if you look at it from far away, uh, it looks a bit like the graph of a function. So maybe it makes sense to approximate it by the graph of a function. And that's exactly what you do in this effective model. So you take a trajectory, which is given by the path of a one-dimensional random walk. Okay, we pin this random walk at zero at time minus n and at zero at time n. Uh, this is to mimic the fact that the interface uh, connects the two corners of the box BN. Then we condition it to be positive. Uh, that's to, to model the fact that the interface in the two-dimensional easing model cannot go below zero. It's impossible. So you put a positivity constraint. And then I still want to model the fact that this layer of yellow phase is unstable. So what I'm going to do is the following. So you look at your path, this particular realization of the path. So you associate to it the probability that it has under the random walk measure, and you tilt this by uh, an exponential of minus the, uh, the, the, the magnetic field, which is lambda over n, times the area of this yellow region. Because the expectation is that you will have to pay because the free energy of the yellow phase is uh, uh, higher than the free energy of the blue phase, you will have to pay something proportional to the area of the region occupied by the unstable phase. Okay? So that's a very natural uh, model to consider. And this defines me a probability and passes. So for this particular kind of effective models, the first results that I know of is a paper by Abraham and Smith from the 1980s, where they considered a very special uh, random walk, so very special uh, kind of uh, transition probabilities, uh, which made the model integrable. This allowed them to compute explicitly various quantities associated to this model, in particular, they were able to prove that the width, that the width of this layer scales like n to the one third, and the correlation length scales like n to the two-thirds. And the correlation length just means the following. So you can 
take two, 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 two positions, say X and Y, and you look at the height of the layer, height of the interface above these two points, then you can see that the covariance between these two heights decays exponentially fast. And the typical distance over which you will see this decay is the correlation length, it scales like n to the two third. So in the early 2000s, uh, with a stop, we uh, extended these results to a very general class of uh, random walk kernels. And we proved again for this general class that the exponents were again uh, one third and two thirds exactly uh, for this particular case. And then the final uh, paper, the culmination in this line of research, uh, is a paper from six years ago uh, that we did with uh, Dima Insenia, where again, for a general class of random walks, uh, we, we proved that if you make the, the natural rescaling of this interface, what is the natural rescaling? I told you that there is a natural vertical length scale, which is n to the one third, and there is a natural horizontal length, length scale, which is n to the two third. So you rescale by n to the two third horizontally and n to the one third vertically. You let n go to infinity, and then you can prove that the distribution of this uh, interface in this effective model converges weakly to the distribution of uh, uh, trajectories of uh, special diffusion, which is called the Ferrari point diffusion that I will introduce uh, later on. Okay. OK, so these are the results for effective models. In parallel, there were also uh, progress uh, in the two-dimensional easing model itself. So the first result I know of is a result of mine, also from 2004, where I showed that the width of this layer of unstable phase uh, is basically of order n to the one third. Uh, actually, I had additional logarithm. OK, and very recently, uh, Ganguly and Gessari managed to remove this logarithm. They really proved that it's n one third. And they also obtained various other global estimates uh, relating to the behavior of the interface in this model. Now, the goal in this work that I'm presenting today is to complete the analysis by, by generalizing these results that we obtained with Dima and Senya uh, for uh, effective models to the two-dimensional easing model. Okay. So before I move to that, I would like to uh, make a very brief parenthesis and explain why n to the one third, where, where does this one third exponent come from? And uh, it's very easy to understand at a heuristic level, at least for these effective models. And one way to, to see this is as follows. So take a, an effective model of the same type as before and force the, the interface here to stay between height h and height 3h. H is a parameter and I want to optimize over H and to see what comes out when I, I optimize over it. Okay, so it has to stay in this tube for the whole time between minus N and plus N. Okay. Now, remember that the probability associated, associated to a pass is the probability of the pass under the random walk measure tilted by this uh, exponential of minus lambda over N times the area. Okay, now uh, there are two, two factors here. The first factor, which I call the energetic cost, so this lambda over n times the area, what is its order here? Well, the area of this yellow region is certainly always larger than h times 2n. It's certainly smaller than 3h times 2n. So it's of order nh. So if you take lambda over n times nh, you find something of order lambda h. So that's the, the energetic cost, so the, the, the contribution coming from the first factor here. But then you also have an entropy cost because for a random walk, as long as h is much smaller than square root of n, it's very unlikely that your random walk stays in the tube of width uh, 2h. Okay? So there is a cost for that. And it's easy to see that the probability that the random walk stays inside such a tube is exponential of minus some constant times n over h square. This n over h square can be understood pretty easily because your random walk is a diffusive process. So it needs a time of order h square to move a distance h away from its. Uh, uh, original position. So your random walk will realize it's stuck inside the tube of which 2h only over time length of order h square. Okay. And how many, so under the, the, the random walk measure, uh, you will pay a price of order one for each stretch of, of length h square in your tube. And you have n over h square stretch of, of this length. Okay, so that's what gives you this. Now, if you want to optimize over h, you would like to have lambda h equals to n over h square of the same order. And this tells you that h has to be of order n to the power one third. Interestingly, this, argue, this very rough argument can be made fully rigorous, and that was the starting point of our investigation with the staff a long time ago. Okay. Now, let me say a few words about this ferrari spawn diffusion. Let's start with the bottom of the slide. So it's a, the ferrari spawn diffusion is actually it's a family of diffusion processes. I'm only presenting the one which is relevant for this talk. 
Uh, it's a diffusion on the positive real line, so on zero infinity with a Dirichlet boundary condition at zero. And it has a generator, which is uh, written here. So you have the usual uh, diff diffusive part, and you have this uh, drift part, which involves the logarithmic derivative of a function phi naught. And this function phi naught is basically the Airy function. So I've drawn here the Airy function for those of you who are not familiar with it. Okay? And what we are doing uh, to go from the Airy function phi naught, we are first translating this uh, Airy function so that its first zero is at zero, like that. Then remember that I'm only interested in the positive values because the diffusion is an R plus. So I'm only interested in this part. And then I still have to make a horizontal rescaling by a constant. And this constant is complicated. Its value is not important. What is important is that you can explicitly compute it. That's why I, I have shown it. It's just because you can compute it explicitly. It involves the spontaneous magnetization, the curvature of the wolf shape, and again, the magnetic field lambda. I mean, magnetic field is lambda over n. Okay? So that's the, 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 the limiting uh, diffusion that I claim uh, will, you will see if you make the, the, the standard rescaling for the easing interface. I will state it uh, precisely in a minute. Uh, I just want to explain one thing. So what does it mean to have a convergence, the weak convergence of the distribution of the easing interface towards the trajectories of a Ferrari spawn diffusion? The trajectories of this diffusion are functions from R to R. My interface in my two-dimensional easing model, it's, um, it's an object which is the boundary of a, a two-dimensional set. A priori, it's not completely clear what I mean by this weak convergence. So let me explain one way to understand it. Or maybe I should have said that. So another way to look at this, uh, more intuitive way to look at this Ferrari spawn diffusion is as a Brownian motion living in an external potential which has this shape. So it has a logarithmic divergence at zero. And it has a tail here, which is growing like x to the three half on this side. And then the Brownian motion lives inside the, 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 this well. Okay, so here I've zoomed uh, on a small piece of this interface that we, I, saw, I showed in, a, in an earlier picture. A small piece of this interface, and you see that the interface is complicated objects. It's very complicated geometry. Okay. So, uh, uh, will you will you say what is the equation for the Wolf shape, or is it irrelevant? Or? It's irrelevant. Okay. Uh, but if you want, at the end of the talk, uh, you can ask the question. I can try to answer something. Okay. Uh, so one way to, to 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 solve the problem that it's not at all the graph of a function, what you see here is to introduce uh, upper and lower envelopes for this uh, interface. And the way I'm doing that is that for each uh, uh, column of spins, I'm going to take the smaller, the, the, the lowest spin, which is above the interface, and I will paint it in red. And the highest spin, which is below the interface, I'm going to paint, paint it in, in green. And if I do that, I get a picture like that. And you see that most of the time, I have my red dot and my green dot, which are just next to each other, which corresponds to uh, cases where you perfectly localize the interface. You know exactly where is the interface if I give you the two envelopes. But you see that also from time to time, you have gaps between the upper envelope and the lower envelope. And this happens exactly when the, the interface is not the graph of a function, of course. Okay. So why is it useful? It's useful for, let's say, two reasons. First, these two functions, this, I mean, this, this uh, upper and lower envelopes, they are functions from the integers to the integers. So that's already nicer. You can easily make them, make them into function from R to R by taking linear interpolation, for instance. So that's already a good thing. They also, uh, if you know what these two envelopes uh, are doing, then you know what the interface is doing pretty precisely because the interface is stuck in between. And the final reason why it's really useful is that these gaps, these nasty black gaps here in the picture, they are very small and very rare. And what you can prove is the following. So uh, you can show that there exists a constant k, which depends on the inverse temperature beta, such that as n goes to infinity, with probability going to one, the largest of these gaps will be at most of size k log n. Okay, so all these gaps are pretty small, they are logarithmic in n. Remember now that the vertical scaling that I'm interested in is a scaling by n to the power one third. So under a scaling by n to the power one third, these logarithmic gaps, they are just going to completely disappear and be completely irrelevant. So the point of all this slide is that it's enough to prove the weak convergence of the upper envelope, say, properly rescaled, uh, to get the convergence uh, to the same object, uh, to the same limiting process for the lower envelope, because they, they are basically equal, and, uh, and then for the interface between, because it's stuck in between the two envelopes. Okay, so now I can state uh, in a, an informal way our theorem. So fix beta larger than beta c, fix lambda positive, 
denote by gamma hat plus the upper envelope, or actually the, the function I get by linearly interpo interpolating the upper envelope and rescaling it, uh, as I said before, so horizontally by n to the two third and vertically by n to the one third. Actually, it's convenient to rescale it also by a constant chi beta, which is this curvature of the wolf shape to power, one, to power minus one half, but that's just a constant that's not dependent on n. And then you let n go to infinity, and then the claim is that the distribution of gamma hat plus uh, converges weakly to that of the trajectories of the stationary Ferrari point diffusion that I introduced in a previous slide. Okay. So now in the rest of this talk, I want to uh, sketch the proof. So the proof is unfortunately pretty uh, long and pretty technical. It's not really easy, but the, the physical ideas that underlie the proof are pretty natural. And I, I hope I will manage to convince you of that at least. Okay. So the scheme of the proof is exactly the same as the scheme you need to prove non-perturbatively that uh, the Dobrushin interface converges to a Brownian bridge, that this Dobrushin interface along the bottom wall converges to a Brownian excursion. It's exactly the same pattern for the proof. Namely, what we are going to do is that we are going to rigorously reduce the two-dimensional easing model to an effective model. And the way we are going to do that is by constructing a coupling between the interface of the two-dimensional easing model and a directed random walk on Z2, which might be subject to uh, some external potential or some additional constraints and things like that. The basically, it will be a, a random walk model, which is a much simpler object to, to analyze and also much more classical to analyze. And then the coupling that we, we will have between the, these two objects will be sufficiently strong that if you manage to prove your uh, uh, scaling limit for the random walk, then automatically you get it also for the two-dimensional uh, easing model interface. Okay. Now this coupling uh, uh, will be based on the so-called Ornstein-Zernike theory. So it's a theory that was developed. Um, okay, that was developed over uh, many papers, many years. Uh, but the two papers which are relevant for the talk today are a, paper, a joint paper with Massimo Campanino and Dima from uh, nearly 20 years ago, and a much more recent paper with Sebastian. Okay. So now uh, let me say a bit more what uh, this ancient theory tells you. And as a warm up, let me start with the standard Dobrushin boundary condition when h is equal to zero. So just the, the case of a Dobrushin interface uh, in two dimensions. Then uh, here is the small pieces of the, the, the vertical sides of the box Bn. Okay. Here is the interface. As you can see from my picture here, I have not drawn all the excitation that you have in the, all the yellow excitation, the blue phase, or the blue excitation, the yellow phase. They don't appear in my picture. The reason is that once you have fixed the, the interface here, the realization of the interface, you can integrate over all these excitations. And this gives you an effective weight for the interface, which is much more complicated than the original weight of the interface. But at least it simplifies the picture because you don't have all this mess around. So I get this interface with a very complicated weight in particular, if you take a small piece of the interface here and another small piece of the interface there, and you look at the covariance between what you see in this, these two places, uh, you can take them as far as you want from each other, they will, the covariance will not vanish and it will not be zero. Okay? There will be uh, some dependence that comes from the fact that information can transit through the bulk. Okay? So this weight is complicated. In many cases, what the einstein zernike theory tells you is that the typical realization of the interface can be decomposed into a, a necklace of uh, uh, small pieces, as in this picture that you can see. So you have all these small rectangles here, and all these rectangles here, which contain the interface. Okay? And the properties of these rectangles that come from this einstein zernike theory is that they are all very small in the sense that if you take the diameter of this rectangle, then these diameters have exponential moments exponential tail. So the biggest one you will see is of order log n. Okay, they're all small. Moreover, they are, they are IID, all these, these rectangles. So I'm a bit cheating, of course. I'm cheating for two reasons here. First of all, they are connecting this point to this point. So certainly they, are, they cannot be IID, cannot be independent, but the only uh, uh, lack of independence comes from this overall constraint that they have to join these two points, which is very weak. So in a sense, the, the joint weight of all these pieces is a product weight. That's what I mean, okay, it's product weight. And the second way I was cheating is that uh, they are all identically distributed except for the first and the last one. As you can see, they are not even stuck into rectangles, the first and the last one. But this does not matter because they are very small. As I told you, all the pieces are small. Okay, so now if I want to control the interface- me, you also only... have a, 
uh, sorry, Ivo, you have a lot of uh, small contours also introducing uh, some, some correlations between different boxes. You have that, but what I claim is that there is a way to randomly split my interface into pieces like that. These pieces are not deterministic function of the interface, they are random function of the interface. And there is a way to do that in order to uh, recover full independence between the pieces. Okay. That's an output of this on and then get theory. Basically, you have, okay, you can first make the optimal decomposition of this type, the, 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 you take the smallest decomposition of this type, and then you get a, a chain of uh, uh, random objects, and then you make a high temperature expansion, a cluster expansion, and then the pieces that remain, the clusters that you get, they are independent from each other. If you want, you can see it like that. Okay. It's really something of this type. So they're really independent. Uh, good. So does this answer your question, Daniel? Yes, it does. Thanks good. a lot. Um, now, since all my rectangles are very small, and my interface is stuck inside the rectangles, if I want to control the geometry of the interface, it's enough that I control the geometry of the rectangle, the rectangles. Now, the geometry of the rectangle is completely encoded in the geometry of the diagonals. Okay, so it's enough that I understand these diagonals, but these diagonals are uh, random vectors in R2, actually Z2, uh, which are IID, so I can see them as the increments of a directed random walk on Z2. Okay, and that's exactly the random walk I was talking about. That's the directed random walk, which is coupled to, inter to the interface in this very strong sense. Okay, and now, uh, uh, and this, moreover, this random walk has uh, exponential, the, the, its increments of exponential tail. So it's a very nice object. Okay, so if you want uh, to prove uh, convergence to the Brownian uh, bridge for this uh, double chain interface, you're basically done because it's very easy to prove the, this, the claim for this random walk. And then you deduce it from this coupling uh, for the interface. Okay. So now let's see what happens in our case. What are the difficulties when we try to do the same uh, type of proof uh, in the setting I'm trying to present in this talk? So there are two difficulties. The first difficulty is that our interface is lying along the bottom wall, okay? which means that uh, if you do a decomposition of the same type as I did here, uh, the distribution, the random walk that you get is not spatially homogeneous. So the, the, the probability, the transition probability associated to this, to this increment, for instance, instance, is not only a function of the increment, it's also a function of the distance to the bottom wall. It's a very complicated function of the distance to the bottom wall. So that's nasty, and we'd like to get rid of this problem. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is that uh, the einstein zernike theory, as, uh, as it was constructed, does not apply when you have a magnetic field. At least does not apply to interfaces when you have a magnetic field. Okay, so I have to do something about it also. So in the next slides, I want to explain how we solve these two main problems. And the first one, the first problem will be solved by proving that the interface, okay, it's going along the wall, but there is an entropic repulsion effect uh, that will uh, result in the fact that the, the interface will be at a very large microscopic distance from the wall. It will still go away from the wall sufficiently far away from the wall that the, the interaction with the wall be, will be negligible. So this I will explain. And the second thing is that we are going to treat the, the, the problem coming from this magnetic field and the einstein zernike theory is that I'm going to relate the distribution of the interface when you have the magnetic field and when you, when you don't have the magnetic field. I'm going to construct, in a sense, an approximate radon nicodym derivative between these two distributions that will allow me to reduce the problem to a problem when h is equal to zero. Okay, so that's what I want to explain now, these two things. And let's start with this entropic repulsion estimate. So, what I, so here you have the bottom of the box BN here, and I'm introducing a small rectangle in red. So that's the main object that you should concentrate on, this rectangle B here. It has a length which is n to the two third minus epsilon. Epsilon is a small strictly positive number, and it has a height which is n to the power epsilon. Okay. My claim is that the interface, which starts at this corner and ends up at this corner, uh, intersect this red rectangle with probability going to zero when n goes to infinity. So it does not intersect with this red, this red rectangle. Okay, that's, that's the claim I want to show. Uh, and the, one of the difficulties when you try to prove that is that you have a magnetic field. This magnetic field, it's making the layer of yellow phase, which is below the interface, unstable. So which, which will reduce the size of this layer of yellow phase. In a sense, it's pushing the interface down. Of course, if it's pushing the interface down, it's making it, making it more likely that the interface intersects the box, the red box, of course. 
So uh, one has to fight against that. And the way we get rid of the, the, this nasty magnetic field is by localizing the estimate in the following way. So we're introducing a new box, see this uh, white box in the picture, which has a length which is twice the length of B and a height which is n to the power one third plus epsilon. Okay. And now uh, I want to, to, to upper bound the probability that my interface intersects this red box. And one way I can do that, uh, you have to prove some things, but let me explain it intuitively, it's pretty obvious, is that if I'm forcing my interface to go through this corner of the, red, the, the white box and also through this corner of the white box, then uh, my interface has to go from here to here and not intersect the box B. So it's, uh, okay. it's making much more likely that it intersects the box B. Okay, it's easier to intersect the box B if you know that you are going from here to here. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting a, an upper bound on the probability that the interface is intersecting the box B. And then using correlation inequalities, you can show that you can actually restrict your attention entirely to this white box. Okay, as if your system was defining this white box and the interface was going from there to there, and you want to upper bound the probability that it intersects the box B. So what did you gain by going from the big box BN to the small box C? Well, what you gain is the following. What is the, the area of this box C? The area of the box C is 2n. Okay, so the effect of the magnetic field inside the box C is lambda over n times the size of the box C, which is lambda over n times 2n. It's just 2 lambda. So it's uh, the, the total effect of the magnetic, magnetic field is of order one, which means that the radon nicodym derivative between the Gibbs measure in C uh, with and without the magnetic field uh, is bounded above and below. So if you have an event which has a probability that is going to zero when the magnetic field is zero, then this event still has a probability going to zero when you put the magnetic field lambda over n. Okay. And now, so that means that inside C, I can just assume that the magnetic field is zero. And then you, you have this interface and you want the probability that it intersects B, but to show that this goes to zero, you can use the fact that uh, we have, that I already stated that in this setting, when H is zero, uh, the interface converges to a Brownian excursion. And from this, you can deduce the result you want. Okay. In fact, it gives you a, an explicit upper bound on the, the probability that the interface intersects this red set. And it's good enough that you can bootstrap this estimate. So instead of taking one copy of the box B, you can take many copies of the box B and make a union bound. If you do that, you, are, you, you get a stronger claim, which is the one I depict here. So again, that's the box BN. And your interface, I claim, uh, when n goes to infinity with probability one, it's never intersecting this green box. And this green box now is much larger. So the height is still n to the power epsilon, but its length is almost macroscopic. It's n to the power one minus five epsilon. Actually, it's super small. Okay. It's not macroscopic, but it's uh, very large. And uh, it's much more than we need. Remember that the horizontal scale that we need to, to, to work in this, this problem is n to the power two thirds. And one minus five epsilon will be larger than two thirds if I take epsilon small enough. Okay. So remember this, the, the interface stays above this green rectangle. I will use it in a few minutes. Okay. Let me turn to the second problem, which is that I don't know how to apply the einstein bernicke theory if I have a magnetic field. Okay. So the, the basic observation is that if you take a realization of your interface gamma here, then this interface splits the box into two sub boxes, the box BN into two sub boxes, a box BN plus, which is above, a box BN minus, which is below. And they are characterized by the fact that along the, the boundary of BN plus, you have plus pins, and along the boundary of BN minus, you have minus pins. Okay. Good. Now, since you have plus pins and minus pins along the boundary, you might expect that the, the average magnetization density that I see in these two regions are given by basically the magnetization of the blue phase, so M star, the plus phase, and the magnetization of the minus phase, the yellow phase in the, the yellow region. Okay, that's what we, we would like to say. If I'm able to say that in a sufficiently strong sense that indeed here, the magnetization is M star times the area, and here it's minus M star times the area, then the total effect of the magnetic field, to this H times the sum over the sigma I, so H times the magnetization, the box at the end, becomes a function of the realization of the interface. It's enough that I know the area of this region, the area of this region, and I can compute this term if I have concentration in the right quantity. Okay, so that's what I want to, to explain. That, that's true, and I want to explain. So what you need to do first is to show that all these excitation, this yellow excitation, the blue phase, and all these blue excitation, the yellow phase, they are super small. The biggest one will be logarithmic in N. Okay, so in the blue phase, there is, 
this is not surprising. It's kind of obvious to, to prove because it's already true when you don't have a magnetic field. So in the in the plus phase, the uh, the biggest connected component uh, you will see of minus spins that you will see will be logarithmic in n. So if you turn on the magnetic field which favors the plus spins, then of course this connected component of minus spins will become even smaller, and of course they will remain at least logarithmic. Situation is much more interesting and more complicated in the in the yellow region because there the minus phase is unstable. So it might be worthwhile, exactly as in this Schumann Schlossmann paper, it might be worthwhile to create a huge droplet of blue phase inside the yellow phase. Why? Because they, they might have negative energy. Because you will pay a positive price uh, along the boundary of the droplet because you will have blue and yellow spins next to each other along the boundary. But inside, instead of having the bad yellow phase, which is which goes against the magnetic field, I would have the good blue phase, which goes in the proper direction for the magnetic field. So I'm getting an area term. Okay. So it's possible that you get a giant uh, droplet inside the yellow phase. And if that happens, it's not true that all contours are small, all excitations are small. So the reason why it works, why you indeed have only logarithmic, uh, logarithmic excitation, is the following. Let's look at what is the smallest excitation you can put in the yellow phase, which uh, has a negative energy. And for simplicity, since I'm doing heuristics, uh, let's consider it's a square of side length D. Okay. Then uh, let's look first at the cost. So you have to pay on the boundary of this square. You have to pay something proportional to the perimeter. The perimeter is 4D. And the cost to go from yellow, yellow to yellow, blue is 2 beta. And then the gain, the gain is proportional to the area, which is D square. And what you gain is twice the magnetic field because you are, you are first uh, against and then uh, properly aligned with the magnetic field. So you get two times lambda over n. So if you want the gain to overshoot the loss, then you need to have d larger than, larger than something like 4 beta over lambda times n. The important thing is that you need d to be macroscopic. Your square has to be macroscopic. But if I want to have enough space in my uh, layer of unstable phase to put a macroscopic square, that means that my interface gamma is going at a macroscopic distance from the bottom wall, which is extremely unlikely. We already saw that uh, even without magnetic field, the, the, the interface goes only a distance root n from the bottom wall. So if you put on, turn on a magnetic field, it will just get lower. And therefore, this will not happen for typical realization of the interface. So that means that all excitations have a positive cost. And from this, you can deduce that they are at most logarithmic in size. So why is it useful to know that all the excitations in your box are logarithmic? Well, you can then use a result from Roberto and Dima from the, 1990, the, 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 the 1890s which tells you that conditionally on the realization of the, the contour gamma, the, the empirical magnetization in your box Bn will indeed concentrate on n star beta times the size of Bn plus, so the, the blue part of my, my box, minus n star beta times the, the size of the yellow part, plus higher order corrections, which are not relevant, so I don't write them down, okay? But basically it's concentrating on this quantity up to very small error. And this first term using the fact that the size of B plus is equal to the size of B minus the size of B minus, I can write it this way. Okay? So I get the first term that does not depend on the realization of gamma. So it's just a constant it will disappear when I normalize and I get this interesting term. Okay? So now uh, from this, I can uh, easily prove that the probability, the distribution of my interface gamma when the magnetic field is lambda over n is related to the distribution when H is equal to zero by essentially up to small errors by essentially this radon nicodym derivative, which is exponential of minus the magnetic field times the sum over the sigma, which I told is just given by, by this term, which you, you see here. Okay. So what you have managed to do is to express this magnetic field term as a function of gamma plus error terms. And this function of gamma, of course, uh, allows me to split the, the probability part and this uh, tilting part uh, when I computing when I compute the probability of gamma under uh, the magnetic field H, so this allows me to uh, use the Einstein-Zernike theory to evaluate this probability here. Einstein-Zernike theory. So let me explain that. So here is a piece of the interface gamma. It's going far away to the left and far away to the right to connect to the corners of the box B n. I'm only interested in the part which is above these green rectangles that I introduced uh, before, which has a height n to the power epsilon. So we know that it's above these rectangles. That's what we saw earlier. And now I'm, apply, I'm applying this on transient theory exactly as before. I'm only interested in what happens above the rectangle, so 
I don't decompose what happens on the left and on the right of, of this uh, green rectangle. So here's, here is what I see. Again, all my rectangles are very small. Again, all my rectangles are IID and they contain my interface. A priori, the distribution, so again, if I want to control the interface, it's enough that I control this increment. So this, I have this direct homomorphism that appears exactly as before. And if I want to, uh, so the, the, this random homomorphism that I, that I have here, as I said before, the distribution of this increment is a function not only of, the, of this increment, but also of this distance to the bottom wall. But now I know that this distance is at least n to the power epsilon because it's above the green, the green rectangle. And therefore, it's so far away from the bottom wall that I, that I can approximate this random walk here, which is spatially inhomogeneous, with its spatially homogeneous counterpart, the one you would get in infinite volume, and show that the difference between the two is completely negligible. Okay? And therefore, I get a real uh, directed random walk here. Okay. Okay, that's what I said. So now let me remind you where we are. So we have seen that the problem, the distribution of gamma when you have a magnetic field is related to the distribution without magnetic field times these up to error terms that I'm not indicating, up to time an expression of this type. And then we have just seen that this second factor, I can couple it. So this probability measure, I can couple it to the uh, probability measure on passes of a direct random walk on Z2, which is this probability of X here. Now, if I was able to rewrite, to re-express this uh, exponential term, which depends on gamma through this uh, Bn minus of gamma, if I was able to re-express it in a term, in terms of only of the random walk x, so in a way that it's measurable with respect to the random walk x, then uh, I this would create me uh, some quantity which only depends on the path of the random walk x, and therefore define me a probability measure on passes of this directed random walk, which would give me a coupling with the original the uh, the, the original interface gamma. Okay, so that's what I want to do. So I have to explain just this passage here. Now I want to convince you that of course I can replace Bn minus gamma by the area uh, under this uh, random walk between the, 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 the path of the random walk and the, the wall. And the reason is as follows. So that's the hard wall at the bottom of the box. These are three of these rectangles that we saw in the previous slide. Um, the dark gray region is Bn minus. And now uh, remember that these rectangles, they are all smaller than log n. And the distance between the rectangles in the bottom wall is larger than n to the power epsilon. Okay. So if I replace the, the area of this gray region by this purple area here, which is the one delimited by the random walk pass, then I'm making a, a relative error, which is completely negligible because of the difference of size between these two quantities. Okay, so I can do this substitution. I'm making some additional error, but against an error term, which is sufficiently small that does not affect anything in the end. And now I'm basically done because uh, if I want to prove that this distribution, once I rescale gamma properly, this guy converges to a ferrari spoon diffusion, then it's enough that I prove that this guy properly rescaled converges to a ferrari spoon diffusion because they are so strongly coupled to each other. Okay, but this measure that you have on, on random walk passes here is just a complete analog of uh, the effective models that I introduced uh, many slides ago. Okay, you had a random walk measure on your path and you had the tilt, which was exactly exponential of minus a constant, I mean lambda over n, times the area of this yellow region. So the area between the, the path of the random walk and the hard wall at height zero. Okay, so exactly when this, this, is a, this is our effective models and we have made a rigorous reduction from the, the two-dimensional easing model to this uh, effective model. So the only thing we have to show is that this effective model, uh, for this effective model, you indeed have convergence to uh, uh, ferrari spoon diffusion. But that's basically what we did with uh, uh, d Senya six years ago. Uh, so I will not uh, explain it because my time is more or less running out. So I will skip this, but I want to explain what, what are the additional difficulties that we have. And they are basically related to the fact that here, I have a directed random walk. In the other case, six years ago, what we had was the space-time trajectory of a one-dimensional random walk, which means that between time minus n and n, my, my, my trajectories uh, was doing two n steps. Here, the trajectory is doing steps of various lengths. And it's doing a random number of them. So we have additional sources of randomness uh, in this problem due to the fact that uh, the object with which we are coupling is a direct random walk and not uh, the, the, the space-time trajectory of one-dimensional random walks. 
in a random walk, but this only changes uh, technicalities in the proof. The whole scheme of the proof is exactly the same as in the paper from six years ago. So only additional technicalities, so it's not so interesting to, to go into them. Maybe in the couple of minutes that remain, I would prefer to mention a couple of open problems that I would find very interesting to investigate. And the first one would be to, uh, so in this talk, in the paper, we only look at what happens when the magnetic field is of order one over n. Okay. A priori, we could choose other scaling. I mean, H could depend on n in various different ways, for example, as n to the power minus alpha for other values of alpha. Now, of course, if alpha is very large, say if alpha is larger than two, then obviously you will not get Ferrari's pool. What you will get is just a, a, a Brownian excursion because if alpha is larger than two, then the total, uh, uh, again, the radon nicodium derivative between your measure in BN uh, with magnetic field or without is, uh, uh, is going, the, the radon nicodium derivative is going to one. So it certainly will not affect the scaling limit. So the point is that if alpha is sufficiently small, then we expect that in all cases, you will always have the Ferrari spawn diffusion as a limit. Okay. So that's something that we'd like to do, in particular the case alpha equals zero, by which I mean that we first take the limit as n go to infinity, so we take an infinitely large system and then let the magnetic field h go to zero. Okay. Uh, that would be very interesting for various reasons that I don't have time to dwell on now. Now, a second open problem that is uh, of interest is uh, to extend the result from the geometry that I've considered in this talk to the geometry considered by Roberto and Senia, uh, which I recall a bit here. Uh, this, I expect, can be done by a coupling. I mean, we should be able to deduce the result for this geometry from the result I've explained a few slides ago uh, by a suitable coupling between the two models. So that should be not too difficult, but we have not yet done it. Not really tried to do it yet. And then the final uh, open problem I would like to mention is that if you look at this, uh, at this picture here, so I told you that the fluctuations of the interface are understood along these curved pieces. It's also understood along the linear pieces along the boundary. That's what I just explained. The only thing that remains to be understood is what happens exactly when these two types of pieces join. So just at the boundary of this arc, okay? And here we are working on it uh, right now. Uh, it seems that uh, if depending on how you zoom in on this point, there are many ways of zooming in on this point, and depending on how you choose uh, to zoom in on this point, you can get fluctuations of the interface that, that are of, of any order between n to the one third and n to the one half. So you really have an interpolation between these two, these two behaviors. So you have n to the one third here, n to the one half here, and then uh, here you have something which gives you all possible uh, intermediate uh, powers. Uh, okay, I will stop here. My time is up. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne, for this beautiful talk. Are there questions? Yes. Can I ask yes, a question? Yeah, I admire this kind of beautiful hard work. And uh, this is a question about the scaling of uh, magnetic field H to the n to the power minus alpha. So if alpha is small, as you said, then uh, I understand this yellow region becomes thicker, the widths become larger. And then I think there is a problem of having uh, blue droplets inside this yellow region. And so yes. doesn't it change the uh, scaling of F, the, the, the action of effective model? So you're Leading completely right. Difficult. So you're completely right. That's the difficulty. That's why we, we have not yet done it. Oh, but uh, I'm asking but, whether you're you're expecting the same physics or yes. But the reason we're expecting different. the same physics, oh. the reason we're expecting the same physics is that on the relevant length scale, if you look at the whole boundary, of course you will see regions somewhere where you will get uh, the interface sufficiently far away from the bottom wall that you will get huge droplets in this. Okay, this will happen. You will have supercritical droplets a bit everywhere along the, along the bottom wall in this, in this layer of unstable phase. This will happen. But the point is that they will be sufficiently rare that on the stretch on which the scaling limit is relevant, the equivalent of this n minus two, uh, n to the power two third that in this particular talk that I just gave, the equivalent in this other case, which is a, if you take alpha equals zero, it would be h to the power minus two third. So if you look at the proper length scale, on this length scale, you will not see 
these excitations mm. that are super critical. But it's very hard to prove, so we don't know yet how to do it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Further questions? Uh, so oh, can I ask? Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. Uh, uh, go on the I, I was wondering, uh, this is about the easing model, and you would uh, probably expect the same Ferrari Schwann diffusion if you were working on the POTS model, say, with the ferromagnetic POTS in a similar manner. Uh, okay, yeah. just making sure. Um, if you were to work in three dimensions, uh, where we, I guess, expect the Gaussian, uh, sort of a Gaussian free field for the Debrussian boundary condition. Uh, yes. Below the roughening, above the roughening transition, depending on how you look. Um, yeah. What would be the analog of this when you put on a magnetic field? What is a Gaussian free field subject to area? So you can look at this paper of mine from 2004 and doing that. Uh -huh, uh -huh, okay. I see. Not very precisely. I'm far from the level of precision of this talk, right? But uh, I'm addressing your question there. So the, it depends on the dimension. So if the magnetic field is H, uh -huh. Don't scale it with scale it with scale it with n. Take just h, then, and take h very small. Then in dimension two, uh, the interface will go up uh, height uh, log of h, absolute value of log h, and then in uh, higher dimensions it will be uh, uh, square root of log of h. I see. Uh -huh. Very good. And probably it remains true if h scales with n. You just have to replace it with uh, corresponding power. And there is a scaling limit as well. Okay, this I don't know. Yeah. The problem, yeah, sure, there will be, but yes. I don't know what it is. Uh, 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 okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Hal, you had another question? Oh, oh yes, but it's a simple question. I was simply curious how this Ferrari spawn diffusion was introduced historically. So what what's the situation? So, uh, like? Yeah, they, they were introduced by uh, Ferrari and Spawn. Uh, they were looking at uh, a Brownian motion constrained to lie above uh, uh, half disk. Mm -hmm. And then you look, at, uh, you look at what happened at the apex of this half disk, just on the top of the half disk, you look at the, the, the distribution of your Brownian motion there, and uh, it's given by this Ferrari spawn diffusion. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, can one understand to, uh, why, why the airy function appears in the in this uh, diffusion, in the drift? Yeah, one can. Uh, I don't know if I can explain it here very easily, but uh, in a sense, this ferrari spawn diffusion, if you look at the whole class of diffusion, they are constructed on storm UV, starting from some storm UV operators. And this, this, as you know, these storm, storm UV operators, they have a potential part. And the potential part here, the, it's the natural one, so it's just the absolute value. So it's x goes to x in the actually it's only positive value. So the function x goes to x over r plus, which is uh, the fact that if you go a distance uh, h from the boundary of the from the bottom wall, the cost of going there is is proportional to h because you are creating uh, the contribution of one particular column of spins uh, of height h to the, the area of this yellow layer is just uh, the height of the layer. Okay, the height of this column. So the, there is this linear potential that comes from the, from the fact that we are paying uh, uh, something proportional to the area of the unstable layer. And this, this, uh, this gives you a storm level operator with this linear part, which is related to the area function. Mm -hmm. And the, the corresponding, uh, okay, it, it's, related, it's immediately related to the area function. If you look at the, the ground state uh, of this uh, uh, storm level operator, the, the ground state is the area function. Yeah. And, and, and I, I wanted uh, I, uh, to ask you about the Wolf shape. I mean, yeah. what, what is, uh, is it given by some equation or? It's given, okay. It's, yes, you, I mean, yes. In dimension two, you can even give it as a parametric equation if you want, it's ugly. But the, the way to understand it is more, uh, there is a construction which is called the Wolf construction. And, uh, uh, which tells you how, you how you can deduce it from the surface tension. So if you know the surface tension as a function of the direction, then there is a construction where you construct the, the Wolf shape as an intersection of half planes. 
And the distance of each of these half planes to the origin is given by the surface tension, the, the direction normal to the half plane, uh, to the boundary of the half plane. And if you take the intersection of all these half planes, you get the, the wolf shape. So there is, there is a general construction for this wolf shape. It's the, the shape that minimizes the, the, the surface tension, the integrated surface tension along its boundary, conditionally on having a fixed volume, say one. So, so uh, it is defined not just for a rectangle or for a square, but for any any uh, any figure. Uh, yeah, it's really an isoperimetric type of object, except that you measure the perimeter using surface tension and not uh, the Euclidean length. Does this answer your question? I, 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 I think so, yes. <laughs> yes, so, so, so for, 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 for any, I don't know, convex, con uh, it is, is it just two dimensional or in any dimension? It's in any dimension. Okay. It's sort of standard in crystal growth field. So not only mathematical physics, but physicists know about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions? So yeah. perhaps ju just a quick question. So, so your method is very robust. So, so if you have easing with next nearest neighbor interaction, for, for instance. Everything dies. Everything not to do anything. Yeah. You see, as soon as you don't have a nearest neighbor interaction, it's not even clear what you mean by the interface. At very low temperature in, say, regime where you can apply Kirchhoff Sinai, or, or for easing, you don't need that. But, but, at very low temperature, when you can use cluster expansion and so on, you have very natural definition of what is the interface. Okay. But you want to go up to the critical temperature. And there you have, I mean, if you take a general uh, uh, model, say with interaction decaying fast enough, but uh, uh, not nearest neighbor, then it's not obvious that the minority spins don't start to percolate when you get close to the critical point. So it's not clear how you should define the interface. I mean, it's not completely obvious. I mean, there are several several ideas how you should do that, but the general theory of uh, non-perturbative theory of, it, of interfaces in finite range systems in two dimensions is not uh, available, does not exist. Nobody did it. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. So here it's really important for us that it's nearest neighbor first to define the interface and then technically because it's convenient to have duality because a lot of the tools you are using there uh, are using duality somewhere. So it's it, okay. Three of plan mm -hmm. and, and so I think Ron was asking about um, the, the POTS model, and there would be no difference. But if you have like something like Blue Make Appel, where there, there is a possibility of having uh, another phase in yes. the two phases you, you look at, this, would, this could be much more complicated. I don't know if it would be much more, I mean, it would be much more complicated because the blume Kappel model is more complicated, it has less tools to, to analyze it. Conceptually, there are some very nice uh, variants of what I've just explained in the blume Kappel model. For instance, you take uh, double ocean boundary conditions, say plus on the top half, minus on the bottom half, mm -hmm. uh, but you choose, you put yourself on the, the plus minus symmetry line in the phase diagram, but where the zero phase is uh, unstable but close enough to the triple point, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you do that, uh, what will happen is that you will get uh, what physicists call interfacial wetting uh, or interfacial adsorption, where uh, there will be, when the, the, the interface between the plus phase and the minus phase uh, will get uh, wetted by the, the, the zero phase. The reason is that the, the, the surface tension between plus and zero plus the surface tension between zero and minus, it's still better than the surface tension between, direct surface tension between minus and plus, mm -hmm. okay? So there will be this layer which appears in between and the, this layer will exactly have the type of scaling. It will be ferrari spoon diffusion, things like that, exactly as I explained, I mean, I expect. Technically to prove the result would be much harder. Maybe it's possible to do something at very low temperature, I don't know. It will be much harder. Thank you. Still a very last question, perhaps? Uh, Yvon, I, I still had a question. I, yes. And um, if nobody else has. Uh, I, I wonder, can one make any sense of this if you have a continuous spin model, like an XY model? Can you talk about like a droplet, although there is no sharp boundary, but is there anything? Exactly. So if you try to 
to replicate what, what I explained right at the beginning. So how, how do you introduce this wolf shape? You are just conditioning yes, the total yes. magnetization. So you, this you can do in the, say, in the two-dimensional XY model. If you try to do that, uh, you will, I don't think you will get anything interesting because the, the, the interface with quotation marks sure, will be macroscopic. So uh, I don't think you will see anything of interest. Uh, when you have, uh, if you go to higher dimensions, though, where you do have several phases, equilibrium phases, then I don't see why not. Uh, of course, the, the interface would still be not as sharp as, as you have here, but uh, a well-defined macroscopic droplet, I think, I don't see why you should not see them. Maybe I, I'm missing something obvious, but right now, <laughs> I don't see why no, you... this, this makes sense, I guess. But, but if you put the, the uh, spins facing one way on the three, uh, three sides of the box and the other way on the bottom half in two dimensions, then you say that the bottom half will go all the way uh, macroscopically in. Uh, there will, I mean, somehow you will see spins which are not so much aligned with the boundary. Yeah, okay, well, there's no long range order. So I guess I understand, but they do put the magnetic field so it helps a little. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've not thought about it. I don't want to say something wrong. <laughs> Maybe with the magnetic field, you start saying something more sharp. I, I, I don't know. Could be. I really don't know. I've never thought about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. One more question, just in case. No, let us thank Kivon for this beautiful talk. Thank you again for the invitation.